Good morning. Morning. Morning, Keegan. Um, I want to take just a little bit of time and go over these last six. I don't know if you had a chance to finish it or not. Regardless, just going to take a few minutes to go over each one of them, and then we will go on. Remember, I do want you to turn me in your copy of SQL worksheet number one and your copy of SQL worksheet number two. Ideally, you'll have both those in by the end of the day today. All right, so <clears throat> that said, let's, uh, let's just go on. As you can see, we want a query that shows the product name, the quantity ordered, the product price, and the wholesale price. And we want that sorted based on the quantity ordered in descending order. So that's down here, followed by the product price in descending order, which is here, followed by the wholesale price in descending order. What you find quite often is when you're dealing with numeric quantities, usually, not always, but usually you want things in descending order. Whereas when you're working with text, names, et cetera, you typically want those in ascending order. So since we are getting the information from one, two, three different tables, you'll notice that we have two joins. Now, <clears throat> I'm not showing this and I don't wanna take the time to go over it. That said, you should make sure, you don't have to do this on your homework, but you should make sure that you're comfortable using either the older kind of join syntax like I've got here or the newer kind that I went over in class. Does that make sense to both of you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, and the only reason that I'm saying that is there are, there are companies, I mean, if you decide that you're going to go and try to get a job, you know, as a database programmer, let's say that you, you won't see this old way. Like I'm showing you here, everything will be done the other way. They're really, you know, uh, again, uh, according to Mr. Smith, he had told me in, a long time ago that he put the system clock on there and the, the newer way is faster. And why is that important? It's important because if, if you are working for a company that's real-time sensitive, in other words, they need information and they need information in less than a second, then it's probably going to be that you want to use the newer way. Otherwise, it really and truly is not going to matter. All right, and let's go on. The next couple were something else, just because of the fact, all right, just because of the fact that they actually bring the programmatic way of doing things in here. You have worked with a switch statement, and when you work with a switch statement, the individual cases you have are cases. Here it's a case statement, <clears throat> and you, so you have case instead of switch, and you have when instead of case, and you have else instead of default. It is totally legit to have uh, more than one when statement in here. We only have one now, but just so you know that. So show a query that gives you the product name, the quantity ordered, the product price, and the wholesale price. However, we want an if statement or a case statement to check on the quantity order. Now, you could argue and say here that a case was almost a little bit of overkill because there's only one example, but the if is really ugly. I don't even want to go over the if with you because half the time when I do the if, I get a syntax error. All right. So what this is saying is the equivalent of if the quantity ordered is greater than five, all right, we're going to give you a break on the wholesale price. So in other words, instead of you paying 100%, you're only paying 75%. Otherwise, you pay the whole price. <clears throat> now, a couple things you may or may not have noticed when we do this, we're not setting anything equal to that. So it's not like you're saying wholesale price equals round the wholesale price You'll multiply it by 0.75 and round it to two. Otherwise, the wholesale price just, just equals it. You typically don't do that when you're working in here. All right. You have very limited 
programmatic functionality like this when you are working with a database itself, just so you're aware of that. Because this was set up to manipulate databases and although it's called structured query language, it's not structured query programming language. Some of these hooks and some of the things that are in here were added later because people needed to be able to do things. All right. All right, jumping up then to number 11. From the customer's table, write a query that provides, this was actually fairly easy, I think. What we wanna do is instead of writing in the state abbreviation, we wanted the actual state name in there, all right? Could this have been done in other ways? Of course it could have, all right? We, and if we did wanna change them permanently, we wouldn't do it through a select, we do it through an update. But basically notice again, multiple wins here. So if the state is now CA, we wanna write out California, OR, Oregon, et cetera. I'm not gonna read all five of them to you. You or this is a, a time when it really is important that you really should put in there unknown. You should, in other words, you should have an else. Some sometime or other, what's going to happen is you're going to run into that case. Somebody adds, I don't know, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan. It doesn't matter. But if you haven't accounted for it here and you don't account for it there the program typically will hang, all right? It's not even that it'll blow up, it'll hang. It won't know what to do, all right? So you always wanna make sure that you put something or other in there, all right? A few more, number 12, as it says here, show a query that provides the customer's first name, last name, and sum of quantity ordered. Now, I do wanna mention a couple things to you. And I realize, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna sit there. In fact, I'll put them down here. I'm gonna just throw this in here. I'm gonna put in, these things that you see right here that I just typed in, and hopefully you can read that. They say, min, max, count, count star, average, and sum. Those six things collectively are known as the aggregate functions. You've done a couple of queries where you have worked with the aggregate function, but the key thing to realize is these four right here, those four, they work on both numeric fields and non-numeric fields. All right, if I wanted to find out the customer who had, had the greatest last name, so if I have, you know, Zig Ziglar probably would be, have the biggest last name as far as Z is bigger than A, B, C, D, et cetera, I'd use max, all right? And I can use min the same way. So these four can be used on any type of field. These two can only be used on numeric fields, and that should make sense to you. All right, so when we look at this, let's, let's just talk for a second too of the difference between count and count star. Let's imagine for a second that we've just hired five new employees. So we're a brand new company. We just hired five new employees in. We hire employee in number one in and offer her $50,000. We hire employee two in and offer him $45,000. Employee three, we offer her $40,000. And employee four, we also offer him $40,000. Now we've got employee number five. We don't know yet what we're going to offer that person because we're still checking on their references. So we're not sure what we're going to offer them. So we, the person we've offered them the job, they've accepted it knowing they don't know their salary yet, but the point is, if somebody says to me, what's the average salary of somebody working there? If I add the ones that you see in gray, and I've got what, 95, 175,000? If I divide that by four, it's going to be about $42,500, something like that. All right. But if I do it by five, now 
it's about 35,000. You see the difference? All right. But the, the thing is, when you do count, it does not include nulls. When you do a count star, it says count everything, including nulls. Does the difference between them make sense to both of you? Yes. All right. I mean, it, it might sound really simplistic, but especially when you're working with numbers, imagine that this was a company where you were constantly hiring new people. And maybe you had thousands of people every day you were hiring. And then you're going to find if, if a lot of them have nulls, there'll be a big difference. All right. And I should mention this to you now, too, because eventually you'll come into this. I don't know. I know Keegan's got a job, Angie. I don't know if you work outside of the house or not. The point is, it's the old game of who blinks first. My sister always tells me this, and hopefully I haven't mentioned this to you guys before. If I did, I'm sorry. But uh, she got her law degree. And while she was studying for her law degree, she was clerking for a lawyer meaning that she was writing a lot of his stuff up, et cetera. And she was, wasn't making bad money. She was making in the high thirties. And then she graduated and, you know, went to, to look for a job and interviewed at a law firm. And they asked her how much money she wanted to make. And she'd even asked me about this. And I said, don't blink first. I said, ask them, well, what, what are you offering? And if they don't want to say that, well, what, what, what uh, typically do you offer somebody who's just coming in? Well, Foolishly, what she said was, well, at the job I'm at now, I'm making 38.5. So, of course, that's what they offered her. So don't ever blink first when it comes to talking about money, if you can help it. All right, end of that sermon. So when we look at these in here, we're using a regular count. So we only want to do a count when there is a quantity ordered. So in other words, we don't want to do a count on the records that we added ourselves, Evan Gudmisted, Charles Corrigan, and Paul Knott. All right. And by now, hopefully, you're comfortable enough with this too. This is a concatenation operator, which says, I want to treat the first name, a blank space, and the last name as though it's one field, and I want you to call it customer name. Again, we are grabbing information here from three tables. All right. And we're saying where, and so we'll have two joins because there's three tables. Now what's new here is this group by. All right. And we're gonna look at that because again, we're gonna go over a couple examples from that sheet that I sent you yesterday. And I just wanna talk about them. Group by does bring in some order into this. So for instance, if I wanted to get some, some totals, let's say a, a, a sum of all my totals, but I wanted to do it by state, I could do a sum and then I could group it by state. When you do group by, sometimes you have to put clauses in here. But with group by, you don't put in a, uh, where clause, because that's up here, it's down here, you put it before the order by, you use what's called a having clause. All right, and maybe we'll see some of those today. I don't remember, I don't think there's one in here, but that's fine. So jumping ahead, number 13, right show the query with, with the vendor name, product name, quantity ordered, quantity on hand. Where the quantity ordered is greater than the quantity on hand. So in other words, where the quantity ordered is greater than the quantity on hand, what this means is some orders which I cannot completely fill, all right? So if it's, you know, if it's, if it's for the sales orders thing, remember one of, their, one of their categories is bikes. So maybe somebody has ordered a type of bike and that type is not in stock right now, that kind of thing. This is a real world type of query that you might be able to use. There's two basic types of people that typically will come up to you as a database programmer and will ask you for information. Information like this probably, probably would 
be asked for by, for example, people in marketing. And they're like, wow, we're really selling out on this bike. Maybe we should raise the price or maybe we should concentrate on that or get more in, et cetera. But turn it around. You could also change around this, this and find out what do you have in stock that you have the greatest quantity of. And whatever that is, you might decide, for example, wow, let's put this on the push list. All right. My wife will always say that to me because if we've got something that we're eating at home and it's about to expire or whatever, she'll say, hey, those are on the push list. Same kind of thing here. All right. And then finally, the last one that's in here, it says run the same query. But the only difference is we talked about this yesterday, that word distinct. All right. Distinct says remove all duplicates. And I believe I showed you this yesterday that we did a select customer state from customers. And since we have 32 customers, we got 32 states. On the other hand, when we said select distinct customer state from customers, we only got those four or five states that we have. All right. Now, again, you both now I want, I want you to just say yes or whatever in that you both heard me. You both are supposed to be turning in worksheets number one and two with your own work. You both understand that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that said then, yesterday I sent you, so I'm going to stop my share and start my share. If I can find it. Thought it was open. Let's see what's there. It is okay. Do list. Come on, where are you? There it is. Okay. Do you see the MySQL tutorial, A Beginner's Guide to Learn MySQL? Yes. All right. A lot of the stuff that's in here, we've gone over, but probably a good half we have not. Now, what I concentrate on when I teach in this class are these two things. I concentrate on DDL commands. You've seen a little bit. You've seen a little create, drop alter we'll talk truncate in a minute all right and you've done a lot of dml you've done many selects you've done a couple of inserts some updates and some deletes as you can see there are also two other kinds of commands the first is dcl data control language and that's typically what a database administrator would do because she or he would have the right to grant access to a certain table or to a certain database, all right? And they can invoke and revoke things. We don't go over that in here because everything that you do, for lack of better words, you are basically the database administrator because the database is on your own machine, all right? There's also something called TCL, Transaction Control Language. And as you can see right there, it says it's those commands which mainly deal with the transactions of a database. We're going to talk about that in just a second in a little more detail. I, I'm hoping you're okay with create. I'm hoping you're okay with drop. I'm hoping you're okay with alter. So let's talk about this stuff. All right. If I've got a table that I've created, and let, let's assume for a second you know, you know that we've dealt with this before, so I'm going to add this and then just remove it right away. Um, let's say we did not need that employees table anymore. So we could do this. We could say drop table employees. All right. What that command does, what the drop table command does is it removes all of the data, every record from the employees table, but it keeps a blank employees table with the schema intact. Does that make sense to you? 
Yes. Okay. Because if you do this, not only does it drop all the records, it totally gets rid of the table. All right. So if the if the goal is to just get rid of the records but keep the table, you use drop. If the table is no longer necessary, maybe you duplicated it or whatever, you use truncate. All right. Comment can be used to literally put in comments. All right. And rename, hopefully that just makes sense as far as what you're doing. All right. You can rename almost anything. So the other stuff that they talk about in here, different types of keys, which we've dealt with, constraints, which we've dealt with, nested queries, which we have not looked at, joins, we've looked at some, but not all of them, and set operations, we've looked at some of those. Now, they've got something pretty simplistic here. It says, I'm going to consider the below database as an example to show you how to write commands. All right. And I'm not sure... The way they've got this set up says just all it says here is table one sample database but to my knowledge i don't know if there is a table two etc all right so we already mentioned comments when you put in comments they're a minus minus you know how we're used to uh, forward slash forward slash for a single line comment when you are working in, in virtually any kind of sql environment it's minus minus or hyphen hyphen whatever you want to call it all right now multi-line comments this doesn't even work like that on all systems i have a tendency when i write a multi-line comment i just start each line with a minus minus all right now we haven't done this we didn't say create schema we've just done the create table because what create what create schema does, all right, it says it's just used to create a database. Well, you can also just say create database and give it the database name. That's what most people do. I've never seen, I have never used an exact create schema command myself. Create table, by now you should be familiar with this. By now you should be starting to get somewhat at least of a comfort level of doing this, all right? So here is an example. So notice this, create table as, we haven't done this. What we're doing here, in fact, let's, let's go through our own example. Let's say that we wanna create a new, a new table and all we want in there is the employee's first name and the employee's last name, nothing else. So we could say, oops, make that smaller. All right, it wants it on a new line, that's fine. We could say, for example, create table uh, just name as select employee first name, employee last name from employees. All I'm trying to show you, I realize ours is called employee. I didn't know if I'd have enough room on one line, but you can create a table based off of an existing table, all right? And it might not sound like a big thing, but a lot of times you've got the information, but I, I only wanna work with a portion of it and I only wanna use it for a little bit of time. I'm doing some testing or whatever. So you create a table like this, you do your work on it, you do your manipulation on it, then you just drop it. All right, alter, you got examples of that yesterday. When you alter a table, by default, when you put something in, it goes at the end. There are ways that you can alter things and put them anywhere. So if you wanted it at the beginning, etc you could put it there but typically when you put something new in you put it in on the end because if you put it in the middle that can be very confusing to people the other thing and telling you this hopefully it just makes sense to both of you and that is that if you're going to go in and alter a table in an ideal world you will alter the table before you put any data into it 
because if you like what like what we did if you remember we went in and we put in that employee hire date into a table that was already populated and you may or may not have noticed when we put it in by default i think when you don't when you don't say not null it goes in as null in other words it can be null if we had gone in and to, and use that em employee table or customer table it doesn't matter but if we had added let's say to the employee table an employee hire date and when we put it in if we had said that it can't be null in other words you need a hire date had somebody else come in and tried to run a query on that table before we filled in the hire dates for, you know the app would blow up all right okay drop you can drop virtually anything. Again, when you use alter, when you use drop, when you use create, those are our three major DDL, data definition language. So when you say create, you've got to tell it what you want to create. Create table. Create table. Alter table. Drop schema drop table there's a drop database as well all right all right now it says this statement is used to delete the data which is present no that's not true it's the opposite of that rename we've already talked about okay look real quickly i'm going to take a drink and look if you would on the screen and see if there's anything that's in there I know there's a couple things we probably haven't exactly talked about, but please see if there's anything that's in there that doesn't make any sense to you. The two most important ones are primary key and foreign key so if you think you've got a pretty good idea of what both of those are about then you're sitting pretty good all right remember that let's suppose for a second that you know our boss says <clears throat> i don't want you to make a i don't know why they'd say this but i don't want you to make a new field called employee id You've got your choice. You can either use the social security number or you can use the employee number. And I want one of those to be the primary key. That would mean that both of those would be candidate keys because either one then could be used as the primary key, even though you should never do that. All right. And one would become the primary key, the other one would be an alternate key. But again, primary key, unique record identifier. Foreign key, typically, again, you put, you, you take the, if you've got a one-to-many relationship, you put the primary key from the one side into the many side table, and you put it in there so that you are able to join the two tables together, all right? More than anything else, that's what, that's what they're, what they are and how they're used. All right. Constraints, not null. That means you can't leave it blank, all right? So if right now, wouldn't be right, but if right now Rankin decided they weren't going to allow null in a GPA anymore, technically, Angie, although you're not getting an F, technically your, your GPA would be a 0, 0.0, all right? Unique, what you, what quite often what you do is Let's let's suppose in that employee table that we have, let's suppose we did add a social security number. So we have employee ID, that's our primary key, but we'd probably take the social security number and give it a unique constraint, meaning the, the database would check to make sure we didn't put in two employees that had the same social security number. All right, check. Is, is about as close when you're creating a table, all right? It's about as close as you can come to um, doing some programmatic stuff. So for instance, let's suppose that we're a four-year college instead of a two-year, 
And if you're a freshman, your grade number is one, sophomore it's two, junior is three, and senior is four type of an idea. We could put a check in there so that if you had a field called grade year, we could check to make sure it was either one, two, three, or four as an example. Not a great example, but I think you get what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Default, we've talked about before. All right. So, for example, again, if we were writing a database for Rankin Technical College, we would probably default the state to Missouri. Now, we've got instructors. Mr. Gudmisted lives in Illinois and drives to, to uh, St. Louis every day. He told me on a good day, it's a 40-minute drive, and on a bad day, it's an hour to an hour and a half. But, you know, he's got a house already that he had in Belleville, and he's happy there. All right, but the point is probably 99% of the people who work at and probably 99% of the people who go to Rankin are, are either from Missouri or live in Missouri now. So it would make sense to set that as a default. Index, again, we talked a little bit about indices, but indexes are set up so that you're able to retrieve information from a database quickly. The thing you have to worry about is if you've got a database, and some people do this, that has tons of fields in it. I have worked with databases where rather than having three or four tables, they've got one table with 40 fields in it. And they put an index on every field. Well, imagine that every time you encountered a new word, you had to go to the index to, to look it up. You could see how long it would take you all right, probably to, to actually get through something. So having a lot of indexes can end up slowing things down. The other thing too is every time you update the database, every index has to be updated, so. All right, for the data manipulation commands, I did mention this one to you, use <clears throat> makes a database active. All right, you're gonna see that soon enough. Insert, I'm hoping that you're both comfortable enough now with insert all right is it always mandatory that you put in the name of the columns believe it or not it's not but usually people do it then you can tell for example id is this name is this parent name is this etc it's much easier when you're mapping things out plus if you make a mistake if i had one two three four five six let's say eight fields up here, and I only had seven here, the system would give me an error, but it would be much easier for me to see what was missing and where I screwed up. Update, again, we've done updates. Update, typically table name, set, field name equals something. Remember that if you don't put a where, so if we didn't do this, if we just said update info student set student name equal Alfred, city is Frankfurt, then if we had a database with a thousand records, a thousand people would have the name Alfred and their, their city would all be Frankfurt, all right? There are people that I know that always, they always, every single time uh, they're about to run either an update query or a delete query, they do first uh, into their database what's called a commit, all right, which is kind of like, you know, when you save a file. That way, if you accidentally screw something up, you can typically revert back again, all right? It's kind of like using Git in a way, in GitHub. Delete, again, you almost always put a where clause. Otherwise, this would delete all of the records, all right? Select, again, you can select the database information in any order you want. When you run a query, the result is called typically the result set. You should try to avoid using select star because typically you don't need every bit of data from a table. Plus, if you've got a database that's very large and you do a select star, it's going to take just that much more time. All right. Distinct, we've already talked about. <clears throat> so it's it's designed to show just unique values. 
Order by we've talked about. You don't have to ever use ASC. It's considered redundant. <clears throat> and just so you know, DESC, which means descending, also has another meaning. If you say DESC space and you put the name of a table, that means then it means describe. So it means describe table. It shows you the schema. So this DESC is an example of what's called an overloaded operator. It means two different things depending on how you use it. <clears throat> group by, I already mentioned. So if you look at the example here, group by country would put all of your people from the United States, then all your people from South America or whatever, however you set it up. And the group by can have a having clause with it as well. All right, notice it comes at the bottom, always at the very bottom is the order by if you have one. If you don't, then the having would be at the bottom. So notice this, this is select, all right, give us a count of student IDs and the city from here, group it by city, but only the ones that have fees over 23,000. So again, having is to group by, that where is to select, basically. <clears throat> the logical operators. <clears throat> you have uh, already seen these. <clears throat> and it's the word and or the word or. <clears throat> Excuse me. The not is typically either the word not or an exclamation point. Arithmetic bitwise, etc. <clears throat> I think these you all know. <clears throat> these are the same as the ones you've seen before, except with bitwise, it'll compare everything. All right. And if you don't know what that means, don't even worry about it. It's not going to hurt anything. Comparisons, we've looked at these. Remember, you can use this right here for not equal to or an exclamation point equal to. The rest of them, I think you understand. Comparisons, I think you understand. <clears throat> the aggregates we went over earlier this morning. So we've talked about min, smallest value, max for largest value, count for the number of rows, average, okay and some, I don't think there's anything special in there. Some of these we've looked at, I've only got about two or three minutes because my 10 minute thing came up about seven minutes ago. So I'll see if I can finish this, but it'll be tight. Between is a shortcut, is null we've looked at, like we've looked at for pattern matching, in we've looked at, we'll look at the exists in just a minute, the exists, the all and the any, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop when we get to that point. But you've seen this already, between 20,000 and 40,000. This is a shortcut for saying where fees greater than or equal to 20,000 and fees less than or equal to 40,000. Either way would work as, just as well. The is null we looked at yesterday. When you say is null, that means in this case where there is no address, here it means when there is an address, like the percent sign means zero or more. So if we say, you know, with a pattern, if we say A followed by a percent sign, it's A followed by anything. If we say percent sign A, it's anything, but it must end with an A. The underscore is for a single character. So if I wanted to use, you know, if I said P, underscore T, it would match pat, pet, pit, pot, put, etc. All right. And here's some stuff with like with some examples that are in there. I think we've gone through enough of these already. All right. I'm going to stop right here, come back as soon as I can generate a new URL and go start going over the in operator because that's a little bit more <clears throat> 